Hello, everybody. Uh, very happy to be here. And uh, I, what I actually wanted to do in the time that uh, I have been given here so generously is to talk a little bit about the interplay between two things that I'm sure that we hold very near and dear, and also relate very closely to how we look at things such as entrepreneurship, uh, innovation, and all of the things that are the subjects of the Global Entrepreneurship Week and the event that we're focusing on here today. Now, the title of my talk is unusually long. Um, it says, I couldn't figure out a way to do this in a shorter time, a shorter amount of uh, number of words, but what I want to say is that technology development is very important for us as people. The other message that I want to get across is that people are also completely essential for technology development to continue. So let's dive in. Now, we've seen all kinds of uh, information. We have uh, probably each one of us has in their back pocket tens if not hundreds of challenges they see that technology and, uh, certain, and development can help address. Now, uh, probably one of the most common ones to look at in today's environment is the global environment, the global climate, the changes uh, that we are seeing in weather patterns and temperatures and so forth. And if you look at the picture there, you can see some of the melting glaciers, as well as some of the graphs. And this is just one of the hundreds, if not thousands, of graphs that we have showing that there has been a rise in temperature. Now, we look towards technology as a part of the answer about how do we address this. And we know that it is not enough for us just to say that we need to change it and somehow the behavior has to change. There is also technical elements that are essential in solving this, both in finding ways for us to keep our living standards as close to they are today by using less CO2 emissions, etc. But there's also a question of how to deal with some of the ramifications we're already seeing. Now, if we look more glo locally to, uh, towards Iceland, we have built an economic development, an economic growth, on the increased access to national, natural resources. We have been looking at fishing, uh, nat nat natural energy, renewable energy from the ground, uh, hydroelectric energy, and also we've been using our natural landscape for tourism, etc. These are limit in limited supply. We cannot continue our economic growth based on just taking more and more of these. So the next step for Iceland is to industrialize, to increase the technical development and, more, and increase the emphasis that we have on using know-how and, know and, and knowledge and innovation and technology to generate products that we export. Now, from my background, if any of you have read it, then uh, I have to admit that I worked at NASA for 10 years, so I'm also kind of partial towards the exploration of the universe. And technology is also an integral part of our future, depending on where we want to go. For example, if we want to go and visit Mars and see what it's all about. Now, when you say technology development in many circles, there is an image that comes to mind. And there is this image of linear progression, and it's often also um, supported by information given out in textbooks or some of the journals and things that we see. Now, I couldn't resist. This is a, a poster that hangs up on the wall in my office at home. Uh, it's by National Geographic, and it's showing the 100 years of history of aviation. Now, if you look at this, they've lined the airplanes up so that every single one of them looks like a natural progression of the previous airplane. It makes you think that you can do technical development just by simply by saying, OK, this is what we have today. Let's now improve it in a certain direction, put some money into it, put some hours into it, presto, five years later, we have the next generation of it. This is the image that is often given. And uh, it's kind of hard to see there, but uh, one of the examples that is given there that is historically so inaccurate is the indication that the X-1 plane led to the X-15 plane, which led to the space shuttle. That is not the way it went, and that is not the way that technology goes. The fact is that technology tends to be very nonlinear. And if we look at the uh, spacecraft that we have there on the, in the top left corner from your point of view, well, some of you may look at it and go, hmm, this looks kind of familiar. This is like the Apollo spacecraft, right? Um, actually, no, but you're right then that Apollo Gemini and all of these used a completely different technology than what is indicated leading up to the shuttle in the aviation poster. This actually turns out to be the latest spacecraft being designed by the United States. Uh, these are on one hand the 
Um, the, uh, oh, what is it called again? The Ares rockets <laughs> are the two rockets on the side, and the Orion capsule is the one on the left. They look very similar to the Saturn. It's a big departure from the space shuttle genre. Now, if we look closer to maybe what we're used to in our daily lives, the kinds of entertainment that we see in massive online, uh, massive uh, multiplayer online games like EVE Online, these are not the natural progression of some goal that was set up in let's move from ping pong in the 1970s up to a massive uh, interaction on the net. These are all things that happen because somebody pushes something forward. Google was pronounced dead many, many times during the time that it was getting born in Silicon Valley. First of all, it was technically impossible to actually do the search this way. And second of all, even if you could do the search this way, there was no way you can make any money off of it. Again, this is something that happens in a different way than a linear progression based on some objectives and some goals that we set forth. Now, finally, in terms of mobile technology, this is just an example of the way that things are changing our lives day to day. Now, if we look at the hardware, sure, that may be progressing in a, in a somewhat linear fashion, um, somewhat linear fashion, but if we look at the applications and the development and the impact that it's having on our lives, that is changing radically every day. Every three months, I find myself with an application on my phone that I cannot imagine how I lived without three months ago. So it's not just a question of me saying, hey, I want some slight improvement in my email access. I'm finding, hey, here is a brand new way for me to look at the world and to interact with it. Now, I'm going to take an example from my past about a technical development that was highly nonlinear. If you look at these pictures, these are pictures of mission operations rooms at NASA. They're from different times. They are from, one of them is from the Gemini, which was pre-Apollo, and one is from Apollo. One is to control the Hubble Space Telescope, and one of them is to control the International Space Station as we see it today. Now, Linear Progression Incorporated could be the subtitle of this picture. In the essence of how this is operated, not much has changed. The computers are a whole lot better, but the basic idea is still that you have people sitting there in this room, getting information from the spacecraft or the astronauts, and then sending back commands, suggestions, or ideas for how to proceed. This is the way that NASA had been developing its mission control for a long, long time. And there wasn't a whole lot of things that were changing in that. The only thing that people might have been looking at is to put completely independent spacecraft far out into the solar system that they could operate all by themselves. But then NASA ran into a little bit of a hiccup. Um, there was this guy that came along. This is, the Na this is the Mars Exploration Rover. The Mars Exploration Rover is the first serious scientific equipment that, has been, that is mobile and has been put on the surface of a different planet. The problem is that this completely collapsed all of the methodology that they had been used to using in the mission control operations. What they found is that the scientists would have each day information coming from Mars about what was going on, and they would have to decide prior to the next day what they wanted to get done. Now, the scientists, of course, saw this as the opportunity of a lifetime. They wanted to squeeze in everything they could possibly think of there. And trust me, you get 150 hungry Mars enthusiasts who thought about nothing but Mars since they started in PhD school, they have a lot of ideas what they want this thing to do. And if you ever met an engineer that is responsible for a billion-dollar spacecraft, he's not on key, too keen on the thing doing too many things that might risk it. So how do we resolve this conflict? And how do we resolve it in two hours? Now, this was one aspect that NASA was running into that was kind of collapsing its, uh, its uh, notion of how to do mission control. This is the other one. The International Space Station, once it had all of its solar panels in place, turned out to be too complex for the humans on the ground to actually be able to address all of the bits and pieces of how to do this. So something new had to happen. And luckily enough, there was something new on the horizon. Now, I'm mentioning this because I happen to be working on this and leading this effort, so it's a close uh, nearby example that I can talk about in depth if people are interested. But that basically, we had been working on a crazy idea that said, what if we actually change completely the way that we do all of these mission operations? 
And instead of people relying on talking to engineers who then talk to people in front of the computers, who then talk to the people who are actually allowed to talk to the spacecraft, we just tell the scientists, here's an intelligent tool. You go and tell the tool what you want to do with the spacecraft, and the tool figures out how to do things so that you don't jeopardize the spacecraft and take too many chances. And that's exactly what we had been developing when the uh, Mars Exploration Rovers came along, and they decided to plug that into that mission. It is now a standard part of each of the mission. It has completely changed how the scientists and everybody else approaches this. This was not something that NASA had set out and said, in five years, we shall have technology to do this. This actually bypassed all of the plans that they had for their mission operations and came in with a new angle to help them out. Now, let's take the same idea, this idea of letting people figure out how to best solve the problems at hand and look at some of the pressing challenges that we have in the world today. For example, transportation. So, uh, sustainable transportation. We have cars, we have buses, we have an electrical car. The yellow one there is uh, something that the students at RU actually built as part of their projects. What can we do to help people use those um, to solve their problems as opposed to just saying, uh, let's have the bus replace the car or have the electrical car replace the car or everything like that. We always then run into the problems of people figuring that they're losing out on something. Now, do we believe that this is possible? Of course. When is the last time any, anybody here actually talked to a travel agent on the phone? Years, decades. Why? Because we have been given tools through Doohop, Travelocity, Expedia, you name it, to basically do all of our travel arrangements ourselves. And we're perfectly happy with them. Now, somebody would have said many years ago, but you have to replace it with something like a travel agent. Turns out that that's not the point. You can just put in the right tools, and you can solve the problem. So, the idea is, let's take this kind of approach, and maybe instead of looking at replacing one thing with another, let's replace the mindset and the tools that we have with something completely different. For example, a small idea that we had at RU was to we found that the students had built a couple of electrical cars. Why not make the, turn them into a very, very, very small uh, car rental agency that could rent out or lend out cars to staff and students who would come by public transportation or on bikes? Now, you have to put that into a, a system that actually works. You have to have computer technology so they can access it and do their planning, and you have to have the reliability uh, of uh, somebody else backing you up if the car breaks down. You have to remember, these are student-built and designed cars. That uh, putting all of this together gives you a small example of a solution of how you can approach it differently than just saying, thou shalt not use your car, or thou shalt use this uh, short-range electrical car instead of your car. Now, we can take it even further. How about the power system as a whole? Um, Iceland has a uh, power system that is fundamentally renewable based on hydroelectric and geothermal energy. But we're seeing some of the impact that this is having on the environment, uh, regardless of which technology you use. And we're also finding, and we've seen this in the discussion here in Iceland, that these are limited in their avail availability. We are already well past the halfway point in the amount of energy that we can get out of these sources. We're also finding, and this, this is shown in some of the graphs here on the right, that the landscape of this is changing, both short-term and long-term. Long-term, we're going to see the flow from the glaciers that goes into the dams changing with the changes in the climate. We're also seeing in short-term, for example, in this weather forecast that you see on the bottom right, how weather and more accurate weather forecasts can actually allow us to better predict how we might want to best use these power plants. So here's another idea. Instead of simply looking at how can we build more dams and add more to the capability of production, can we look at the system as a whole and help change the behavior and help change how we control it so that we can distribute and use energy that we already have as efficiently as possible? And it doesn't require a lot. Just a couple of percent is just like building a new dam. Now, what's the key message here? Is it that we should be using the technology that I had been developing? Absolutely not. It's just an example. The key message here is that it's people who drive the technology development, not some five-year plans, not some political uh, objectives, not something that we set in front of us. And in order to ensure that we have all of these people 
supporting technology development, we need to get people enthusiastic about it, we need to get them interested in it, and we need to get them educated so they can tackle it. And that's the final point that I want to address, and it's a big challenge. This is a huge challenge for everybody, but in particular for Iceland. We see reports from Europe, we see reports from the United States, where they're worrying about the future supply of technically educated people. In Iceland, we're finding that uh, the traditional industries are getting capped out just because they're limited resources, but we're finding that the knowledge-intensive industry is growing hugely. The problem with this graph is that it's going to get cut short or flattened out because we don't have enough supply of technically educated people. So the challenge that I want to put forth is how do we make sure that in the future, near future and long term, we have all of the people that the technology development needs so we can achieve these objectives that we want. And we're going to have to do it by encouragement from early on. For example, these students who are trying out, uh, these are about 14, 15 year olds, trying out different technical projects so that we can continue graduating large groups of technically educated people who are enthusiastic and interested in working on the technology development for the future, because without the peoples, we can make all the plans in the world and we won't get anywhere. So thank you very much.